With our new models of the proton and electrons, is it now possible to propose likely mechanisms for how the various neutrino detector materials actually see neutrinos? To see, let us first consider the two neutrino reactions that occur within the deuteron, the neutral current and charged current reactions. These are the reactions that the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory used to declare that neutrino oscillations actually do occur. In the Sun, a deuteron forms when two protons collide and emit a positron and an electron neutrino. 90% of the neutrinos from the Sun are produced this way. Although many pairs of protons are continually colliding within the Sun, only a small fraction of the collisions result in deuteron formation. So, how can our new particle models give some insight into why this is? First, when two protons collide to form a deuteron, that deuteron has a mass of 1,875.61 MeV, or 3,670.48 free electron masses, and a charge of plus one. Per our model, if the mass of a beta electron is 0 0.99954 times that of a free electron, then this is apparently 3,673 beta particles, 1,836 beta electrons, and 1,837 beta positrons. Since the starting two protons, each having a plus one charge and containing 1,837 beta particles, 919 beta positrons, and 918 beta electrons, together contain 3,674 beta particles and a plus two charge, one beta particle, a beta positron, is lost in forming the plus one charge to deuteron, apparently as part of the free positron emitted during formation. This causes the two nucleons to have to share a beta positron between them, to each have the 919 beta positrons to feel like a proton, binding them together. For the free positron to form, a beta positron must couple with an electron antineutrino. Since an electron neutrino is also emitted during the deuteron formation, it appears that the collision of the two protons produces an electron-neutrino-antineutrino pair. The neutrino pair production apparently occurs when two protons with enough combined energy collide. A beta positron captures the antineutrino, forming the free positron that is emitted, and the neutrino exits the nucleus seemingly unaccosted. One may wonder, why is the neutrino not also captured by a beta electron to form a free electron? It appears that an individual nucleon cannot have a charge greater than plus one or less than zero. Losing the beta positron causes one nucleon to go from a plus one charged proton to a zero charged nucleon that is essentially a nuclear neutron. Assuming the neutrinos move in opposite directions to conserve momentum, if the electron neutrino couples with a beta electron in the other nucleon and carries it off, that nucleon would be left with a plus two charge. For some reason, not known at this time, this is apparently not allowed. It appears all nucleons must have a net charge of zero or plus one. It is likely that, if the neutrino does couple with a beta electron during the formation, the resulting free electron formed is immediately disassembled and the beta electron recaptured by the nucleon with the neutrino exiting the nucleus. So, can understanding the interactions between neutrinos and the beta particles that occur during deuteron formation 
provide a workable explanation for what happens when electron neutrinos interact with deuterons? First, clearly, whenever an electron neutrino with enough energy interacts with a deuteron, it somehow breaks the lone bond holding the two nucleons together, causing them to separate. In addition to breaking the bond, apparently four other things can happen. In one scenario, the neutrino can interact with a beta positron in the neutral nucleon, the neutron, in which case it will just scatter off it but cause the deuteron to split into a neutron and a proton. In a similar case, the neutrino can interact with a beta positron in the positively charged nucleon, the proton, and again scatter off it but break the deuteron up into a proton and a neutron. In a third scenario, the neutrino can interact with a beta electron in the proton of the deuteron. This may cause the two to momentarily couple and become a free electron. However, before it escapes, the newly formed free electron is disassembled by the nucleon and the beta electron recaptured because the nucleon, a proton, needs that beta electron to keep it from having a charge of plus two. The neutrino is re-emitted and appears to have just scattered off the deuteron, which is broken up into a neutron and a proton as a result of the interaction. Finally, the neutrino can interact with a beta electron in the deuteron's neutron. The beta electron captures the neutrino to form a free electron. The newly formed free electron is allowed to escape the deuteron, transforming the neutron into a proton. The two protons fly apart so that the interaction produced two free protons and a free electron. The neutrino vanishes after the interaction, now part of the free electron. Of the four scenarios, three of them resulted in a deuteron splitting into a neutron and a proton. These are the neutral current reactions measured in snow. The fourth interaction results in the deuteron splitting into two protons and a free electron. This is the charged current reaction measured in snow. The thing to note here is that all four interactions were induced by electron neutrinos. Since there are essentially the same number of beta electrons as beta positrons in each nucleon in the deuteron, an electron neutrino has an equal probability of encountering either the beta electron or the beta positron in either the neutron or the proton of the deuteron. This means that, on average, three out of every four times an electron neutrino interacts with the deuteron, it will scatter off it, breaking it up into a proton and a neutron, the neutral current reaction. One out of every four times, it will convert the neutron and the deuteron into a proton and split the two nucleons apart the charged current reaction. That is, in a flux of electron neutrinos, deuterons will display the neutral current interaction three times as much as it does the charged current interaction. This is exactly what Snow measured. Snow measured a flux of 5.44 million neutrinos per centimeter squared per second causing the neutral current reactions, but only 1.75 million neutrinos per centimeter squared per second, one-third as many, causing the charged current reactions. So, a relevant question becomes, did Snow really see anything other than electron neutrinos in its deuteron detector? It appears not. What were interpreted as mu and tau neutrinos were apparently electron neutrinos. It seems the electron neutrino flux is not one-third of the neutral current flux as interpreted by Snow, but actually 
the sum of the charged current and neutral current fluxes. Snow did not see 1.75 million electron neutrinos per centimeter squared per second. It saw 7.19 million electron neutrinos per centimeter squared per second. In light of reanalysis of the Sudbury data, it is useful to revisit the results of the other neutrino detectors. The two gallium detectors, Galax GNO and SAGE, both reported about 55% of the expected neutrino flux from the sun. Those detectors relied on the neutrinos interacting with gallium-71 to form radioactive germanium-71. The gallium-71 nucleus has 71 nucleons, of which 31 are positive and 40 are neutral. The germanium-71 nucleus also has 71 nucleons, but 32 of them are positive. From the reaction, like the electron-neutrino reaction with deuterium in snow, it appears the neutrino interacts with a beta electron in the gallium-71 nucleus to form a free electron. Once the free electron exits the nucleus, it leaves it with 32 positive nucleons, making it germanium-71. However, unlike the deuteron, where its two nucleons are held together by only one bond, the nucleons in the gallium-71 nucleus are all held in the nucleus by multiple bonds. Because of this, the neutrino cannot separate a nucleon from the nucleus when it interacts with the nucleus by breaking a single bond. As is the case with the deuteron, the electron neutrino can interact with a beta electron or a beta positron in the gallium-71 nucleus. When it interacts with a beta positron, it just scatters off it because it cannot couple with it to form a free positron. Only the electron antineutrino can do that. Since the neutrino cannot break up the gallium-71 nucleus, there is no indication that it scattered off it, as was the case with the deuteron. It cannot be seen. When the neutrino interacts with a beta electron in gallium-71, it can create a free electron and form radioactive germanium-71. This interaction can be seen. Assuming the neutrino can interact with any nucleon in gallium-71 with equal probability, it can interact with 31 positive nucleons and 40 neutral nucleons. If, like in the deuteron, only the neutral nucleons will give up a beta electron to the electron neutrino to form a free electron, then the neutrinos will also scatter off the beta electrons in the positive nucleons, leaving no sign of those interactions. Consequently, only 40 of the 71 possible interactions can be registered by the detector, 56%. This is essentially the same fraction of the predicted electron neutrino flux the two gallium detectors saw. So, it seems the gallium detectors were seeing the calculated electron neutrino flux, but could only show 56% of it. The other 44%, about 60 SNU, are electron neutrinos that interacted with the beta electrons in positive nucleons in the gallium-71, only to scatter off them without converting the nucleus into germanium-71. In light of this revelation, there is at least one possible explanation for the discrepancy seen between the measurement and the calculation. The cross-section used in the calculation likely assumed that any interaction between a neutrino and a gallium-71 nucleus would convert the nucleus into germanium-71. In other words, the cross-section was calculated assuming a neutrino interaction with any of the 71 nucleons in gallium-71 could convert it into germanium-71. If the beta particle model of the nucleus employed here is correct, then it is apparent why this is not the case. Because nucleons cannot have a plus two charge, 
Only interactions with the neutrons appear to convert the gallium-71 into germanium-71. This explanation is debatable, however, since measurements of the gallium-71 neutrino cross-section using a chromium-51 neutrino source in both the Galax and the SAGE detectors seem to corroborate the calculated gallium-71 cross-section. However, the chromium-51 neutrino sources produced a flux that was as much as 18 times that of the solar neutrinos in Galax and 50 times in SAGE. The sources also radiated through the gallium-71 from the center of the detectors rather than shine down on them like the sun. These together likely enhanced the ability of the neutrinos to interact with neutrons in the gallium-71. It is unfortunate that the cross-section measurements were not done with source neutrino fluxes comparable to that of the sun shining down on the detectors rather than radiating through them. Since there are essentially an equal number of positive betas in a nucleon as there are negative betas, there should be an equal number of neutrino interactions with positive betas in gallium-71 as there are with negative betas. This means that, in addition to the 71 neutrino interactions with negative betas, 40 detected and 31 undetected, there must be 71 neutrino interactions with positive betas that are also undetected by the gallium-71 detector. Consequently, only the 40 interactions that convert gallium-71 to germanium-71 out of the 142 possible interactions, 80 with a neutral nucleon and 62 with a positive nucleon, can be registered by the detector, about 28%. The other 102 interactions are like the deuteron neutral current interactions in snow. They do not appear to convert a neutron into a proton or convert an electron neutrino into an electron. However, since they cannot break up the gallium-71 nucleus like the neutrinos did in the deuterium interactions, they cannot be detected. This means that Similar to the SNOW results, the 70S and U charged current type reactions measured by the two gallium detectors represented only 40 over 142 times the total electron neutrino flux the gallium-71 actually experienced. By considering the neutral current type reactions occurring not revealed by the measurement analyses, the gallium detectors were actually seeing about three and a half times the 70 SNU, about 248 SNU, nearly twice the calculated value. Like the gallium detectors, the chlorine detector relies on the electron neutrino to convert a stable isotope, chlorine 37, into radioactive argon 37, by coupling with the beta electron. Since the reaction is similar to the gallium-71 reaction, one might expect a similar measurement result. There are 37 nucleons in chlorine-37, and 20 of them are neutral. Therefore, the detector should see 20 out of every 37 interactions, or 54% of the predicted solar neutrino flux. However, the Homestake detector only measured about 33% of the predicted flux. What is causing the discrepancy between the two? The electron neutrino flux the detector saw during the exposure period is related to how much argon-37 was produced in the detector. This is determined by collecting the argon-37 gas from the detector and counting the radioactive disintegrations it produces in a counter. The general expression used to determine the argon-37 production rate, P, from the number of argon-37 decays the counter counts, N sub C, is shown. Here, 
Lambda is the argon 37 decay constant, and T sub EXP is the exposure time of the chlorine 37 to the neutrinos. This indicates that the number of argon 37 nuclei produced is essentially proportional to the argon 37 decay constant, which is inversely proportional to its half-life. Argon 37 is created in the laboratory by bombarding chlorine 37 with either a proton or a deuteron. The mass of the resulting argon 37 nucleus at 36.956690 U is greater than the chlorine 37 nucleus mass of 36.956577 U. The collision increases the mass of the nucleus. This likely happens because during the collision, the proton or deuteron transfers one of its beta positrons to one of the neutral nucleons in the chlorine 37. This makes it a positive nucleon and the nucleus argon-37. This argon-37 nucleus has a half-life of about 35 days. When argon-37 is created by an electron neutrino interacting with chlorine-37, the neutrino apparently couples with one of the beta electrons in a neutral nucleon in the nucleus. This results in the formation of a free electron which exits the nucleus leaving the nucleus with 18 positive nucleons, making it argon-37. The loss of the beta electron should make the mass of the resulting argon-37 nucleus less than that of the chlorine-37 nucleus. This means the argon-37 nucleus from neutrino interaction is different from that created by proton or deuteron bombardment in the laboratory. This begs the question, do the different configurations of argon-37 decay at different rates? Does the nuclear configuration determine the half-life? If so, then the neutrino flux value determined using the laboratory argon-37 half-life of 35 days is probably incorrect. If the half-life for the neutrino-induced argon-37 nuclei is shorter than that of the proton-deuteron-induced argon-37 nuclei, then its decay constant would be larger and the calculated argon-37 production rate would be greater. A look back at the home stake experiment data may give some indication of this.